I do want to say, uh, I want to give honor uh, to those who have gone before us, who have passed away, uh, fighting for this nation, this, this country, the United States that we love to live in, that we have the freedom to worship the Lord, and those who have passed away and laid down their lives so we can have these freedoms. I want to give honor to those. I want to give honor if you serve in the military. Thank you for your service uh, to our nation, to our country. And um, finally, I do want to give the most honor, infinite amount of honor, to the ultimate one who laid down his life for the ultimate freedom, not just freedom in this world, but freedom from the next, and that is Jesus Christ uh, on Memorial Day today, okay? So praise the Lord for him, and praise the Lord for all of you and those who have gone before. Um, but hey, guys, I'm so excited to jump into this uh, half sermon, okay? This is the book of Mark. We're going to do a half sermon because the other half of the sermon, now starting this week today, uh, the, the last Sunday of every month, we're going to start doing a live Q&A. Uh, where you get to, we, we, you're going to put us on the spot, okay? I don't even know what's coming my way in about 20 or so minutes from now, but I'm looking forward to it. Where you can ask anything you want about God, about the Bible, about life, hot topics, um, about the, you know, Salvation Church ourselves, whatever it is, you can ask anything. So take a picture if you want of that number right there and spam it because it goes to a great brother of Christ of mine. Uh, but, uh, but feel free to uh, go ahead and text questions through this half sermon I'm about to give. I don't care. And just get ready for that. And then we're going to transition as Josiah Swenson, who's going to be helping facilitate that, who leads our young adult ministry. So I'm really excited about that time here in just a little bit. Um, but Without that, uh, without further ado, I do want to get right into the text in Mark chapter 7. Now, I'm going to give one verse here. As you can see, verse 37, this summarizes what, what I believe, what the God wants us to hear from what is written here. And that is this. This is a crowd talking about Jesus. And he said, they said, they were astonished beyond measure. Why? Saying he has done all things well. Jesus is the only human who's ever done all things, everything well or perfect. Jesus is. Now, why was he able to do everything well? It's because he's not just a human. He is the God-man. He is God who is perfect, who is able to do all things perfect. Now, this may be a newsflash maybe for some of us in the room, but we're not God, right? We're not God. In fact, I think it's healthy sometimes for us to hear that. So why don't you just turn to the person that's sitting next to you, you came to church with, and just tell them with a smile, you're not God. Go ahead and do that right now. You're not God. All right? Someone say that to me right now, right? And you're not God. Okay, all of you really enjoyed that, actually, I think. It's, it's healthy. It's healthy. Okay? We're not God. And, and so we can't do all things well in and of, in and of ourselves, but... When we believe in the gospel of Jesus and repent of our sins, God gives us the Holy Spirit who is God, who lives where? Inside of us. And in, if the Spirit is in us, he, over our whole life, will transform us to become more like Jesus so that we can more and more do all things well, right? We can honor the Lord, please the Lord in, in more and more ways. So we're going to learn from Jesus' life here in, these, in these, this section, just quickly, six lessons, how you and I can more and more do all things well for the glory of God. And so looking at verse 31, we're jumping in. It says that then Jesus returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And then here's what happens. 32, and they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. So we have a guy here who can't hear, and he's a speech impediment. Probably he was born deaf, and when you don't know how to hear, you don't know how to talk. You, not learn, you can't learn how to talk. So a lot of times people born deaf uh, kind of make groaning noises, grunting kind of noises. In fact, just in the last couple of weeks, we had a, a team of our face-to-face -face team who go door-to-door -door and invite people to church and offer to pray with them and, and share the gospel when that arises. And uh, they came, one of the teams came back to me and said there was a person at their house and they were deaf and they were making grunting noises as they were trying to communicate at the door. And so that's who we have here is uh, someone who is deaf and cannot talk. And so let's look at what happens in verse 33. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, Jesus, get this, puts his fingers into his ears 
And after spitting, touched his tongue, and looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephaphatha, that is, be opened. Now, one of the most important things in life, guys, is that when you and I read the Bible, we don't just read over things. Okay, we got to make sure we understand exactly what's going on, we, that we ponder and, and understand. And so I thought that one of the best ways for us to understand and get out of this text what is going on and what God might be trying to say to us is that we need to do a little reenactment of what Jesus has done here. And I love that today we have some special people in the room. We have some of the kids. Hey, kids, are you there? Say hi. 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 Okay, I need a couple volunteers. Okay, I need one person to volunteer to be Jesus. I need another person to volunteer to be uh, the deaf and, and mute person who cannot talk. So anybody want to raise your hand really quick? Who's Jesus? Okay. All right. You know what? We're going to we're going to go for. All right. Nevaeh is going to be acting like Jesus. Okay. All right. And you are going to be the deaf uh, child who can't talk. Okay. So why don't you come on over here? Nevaeh, come over here. All right. And so. Do you guys remember, now remember, when you act this out, do you realize you are helping the rest of everybody in this room to understand what this is saying? Isn't that cool? And even more than that, to be able to hear what God's trying to speak to us. So it's really important that you do everything that I ask you to do. All right, here we go. So you're Jesus, and you're the deaf girl in this situation. It's a boy in the Bible. But, and so here's what was going to happen. What was the first thing that Jesus did to the guy? Do you remember what, it, what I just said there? Were you listening? No. Remember, he took his fingers and did what? Did he? Ah, okay, so go ahead and put your fingers in her ears. She said no. No, yes, this is important. This is important for all of us to understand. You need to, okay, put your fingers in your ears. It's okay. It's okay. If you can't do this one, you're not doing the next one. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> I winked. It's okay. Okay, do your ears. Do you want to play Jesus and, and she be the deaf person? You want to do that? You put your fingers in your ears. Can you do that for us? It's really important for us to understand what's going on with Jesus. Okay. <laughs> you got to think they're right there. Okay. All right. So that's what Jesus did. Isn't that crazy? He put his fingers in our ears. Now, again, this is really important that we reenact this because this is important. We're going to grow in the Lord by doing this. So the next thing, do you guys remember what Jesus did next? He spit. Yeah. He spit on his hand and then took the spit and put it on the guy's tongue. So I'm going to count down from three. Okay, are you ready? Are you you're gonna, be, you're gonna be Jesus? Okay, so you get the better end of this actually now. Are you ready? On the count of three, you can spit on your hand. You can put it on Nevaeh's tongue. Okay, three, two, just kidding. <laughs> okay, let's give him a warm welcome. Good job, guys. Good job. Okay, so you know, so true story, man. Recently, I heard about a pastor in a different state that has a kind of a big ministry and so forth, and he literally reenacted all of that for real with somebody, okay? And so uh, a lot of people gave him a lot of hard time about it, and rightly so. We are going to use this gift called an imagination for the rest of that and, uh, and imagine that. But like, um, by the way, I, I never fact-checked it, but I guarantee this guy probably did not play the part of the deaf person. I bet he played, you know, like I bet no one put their spit in his mouth. Anyway, we're, do, do, we're not doing that. But, but here, here's what I want us to see out of what Jesus is doing here. A couple things. I want us to understand the personal nature of what Jesus is doing here. First of all, did you notice that Jesus took this man out of the crowd privately? Did you see that in the text? Here's a question. Could he have just said, oh, yeah, yeah, you're healed, and just healed him as soon as they yelled out at him, yes or no? Yeah, he could have done that. But he chose to take this deaf and mute guy out of the crowd privately. That's Jesus getting personal. Guys, listen, Jesus loves you and me. And he cares about us personally. Do we understand that? He wants to meet you and I exactly where we are at. He, he sees us. He gives us 100% attention of his attention to us do we realize that and i know some people might say well wait there's so many people on the planet i mean there's so many people in this room alone how can jesus give me 100 percent attention but again it goes back to the fact that he's god and he's omnipresent which means he's able to give 100 percent of his attention to every one of us at the same time 
I want us to understand this, guys. I don't want this to go over our heads, that he cares about us personally. And I know some of you right now, if you're going through a struggle or trial, like that says a lot, that means a lot to you. But it really, it should mean a lot to all of us to ponder that the God of the universe loves me personally. Praise the Lord. Well, he gets even more personal with this guy. You notice again, crazy what he did. He puts his fingers in his ears, puts spit, puts it on his, touches, touches his tongue. Then what does he do? He does, he does a big sigh, and then what did he do? He looked up into heaven. Do you know what all that is to a deaf guy? That's a form of sign language. He is being dramatic. Did he have to put his fingers into his ears to heal him that way? No. Did he have to do all the spit in the tongue stuff? No. Did he? What he is doing here is he is meeting this deaf guy where he is at, being overly dramatic with the form of sign language to say, I'm about to heal you with the power of God who is in heaven. You may be healed. Wow. That is pretty phenomenal when you think about it, that he met him in such a personal way way. Well, check this out now. There's a guy uh, back in early church history, Ephraim the Syrian in 373. Listen to what he wrote about this moment. He said, at this moment, with fingers that may be touched, this deaf man touched the Godhead who may not be touched. Wow, that's crazy. Immediately, this loosed the string of his tongue and opened the clogged doors of his ears. For the very architect of the body itself, that's Jesus who is God who made the human body, and the artificer of all flesh had come personally to him. And with his gentle voice, tenderly opened up his obstructed ears. So again, guys, listen, God loves you and me personally. He wants to meet you and I personally where we are at. So I'll ask this question. What trial are you going through in your life right now? Or trials? What are the struggles, the things that we're going through right now? That we're losing some sleep over? That our blood pressure maybe is up because of it? That we just don't know what to do? Whatever those things are, Jesus wants to personally meet you and I in those things. He wants to give those of us that need strength. He wants to give you and I strength. For those of us that need hope, he wants to give us hope. Those of us that need peace, he wants to give you peace. Those that need guidance, he wants to give us guidance. And, but the thing is, is he wants to meet us personally, but here it is. Here's our first lesson. If we want to do all things well, we got to be willing to get personal with him too, though. It's an invitation from him, but we got to accept that invitation. we got to be willing to get personal, and it starts vertical with our relationship with God. Are we willing to get personal with him? How do we do that? Prayer. Breaking away from life. Listening to him as he speaks to us. Spending time with him. Taking a prayer walk. Taking a walk in the woods. Breaking away from things. Brothers and sisters in Christ. I know that a lot of us know this. But are we doing it? When is the last time? That we spent some good, rich, personal time with Jesus Christ and allowed him to personally minister to our souls. And, and, and I encourage you to, to cry out to him and to throw your heavy burdens on him because his shoulders are the biggest shoulders ever. He can, he can take it. And I'll say this, for those of you who may not know Jesus Christ personally yet, that's the whole thing. That's where the gospel starts. Jesus died on the cross, rose from the dead, and, and he offers to personally come and save you and to come inside of you and give you the Holy Spirit if you give him your life today. So make sure you believe in the gospel and repent and start a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He cares about us. One of the best ways I love to describe Jesus is he's my best friend. Listen, either Christians, we are, we are insane because we're talking about our invisible friend or it's real. And I'm telling you right now, Jesus is as real as anything gets. And he is my best friend. And I love, I love the personal friendship that I get to have with him. 
And I want so bad for everybody in, in, that hears my voice to experience the same thing of what he does for you. Well, not only are we wi- need to be willing to get personal with him and to spend time with him, but also we need to be like Jesus and be willing to get personal with other people. Right? A horizontal relationships. You see, Jesus came from heaven and came into this messed up world and got very personal with people. And then here, even with this guy, he, he literally even brings him out of the crowd to meet him where he's at. So just the same way, brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus said, as the as Father sent me, so while I'm sending you, is that we got to be willing to get personal with people, especially unbelievers. And there's a gift called hospitality that God has given us. To open up our homes and to build friendship to relationships with people so that we can love on them and, and you share the gospel and so forth. So here's the question. Are we, are we getting personal with other people or are we always keeping a big distance between those that we say we love and try to reach them with the gospel? I'm so encouraged to hear that. I know some people in our church just the, just the weekend had a big old par- party and gathering for all their neighbors because they understand that Jesus came to personally meet people and they did the same thing and they're being hospitable. So let's make sure we're willing to get personal with God, but also personal with other people. That's what Jesus did. Let's go on. We're going to see some other lessons here. Verse 35, what happens? His ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They're just excited. They are amazed. In fact, that's what it says, verse 37. They were astonished beyond measure. They were saying he has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Notice that phrase, he he does all things well. What does that mean? That everything, anything, all things he does, he does it well. And anything that's broken, he can't fix it. Anything that's broken in our lives, he can fix it. Do we believe that? You're like, I got a financial situation, it's broken. God can fix it. Are we willing to ask him? I got a relationship broken. God can fix it. Do I believe that? And am I willing to ask him to fix it? I got something broken emotionally in me. God can fix that. Do I believe that? Am I willing to ask him? I'm broken physically, man. I'm falling apart. God can't fix it. Do we believe that? And are we asking him for those things? He's inviting us to ask him. Nothing is impossible for him. He can. He can do all things well. Now, don't cut off my sermon right there. Even though he can, even though he invites us to ask him to fix things. Are you ready for this? Many times God, in his wisdom and sovereignty, chooses not to fix everything that we go through in this life okay now here's the beautiful thing he has promised for those of us that are his children those of us that have believed and repented he will fix every trial of our life in the next life can i get an amen in church on memorial day amen amen i know we're tired and all that but like amen he's gonna fix it right we have that hope as christians but here's the beautiful thing If he doesn't fix our trial, he's fixing our soul through the trial. You believe that? That's what he does. If he's not going to fix my trial in this life, I know he's fixing my soul using that trial. And so in that way, he's always doing everything well. Whether he fixes it and removes a broken something in my life now, praise God, we should ask him and believe it. But if he doesn't, I always know he's working everything out for the good of those that he loves and that is called according to his purpose. And so here's the second point, guys. Are we willing to trust that God is always doing things well? That one, he can't fix whatever it is in my life and I should ask him. But even more than that, if he chooses not to, he will always fix it in the end. And he's fixing my soul. He's refining me. He's using the trial to make me think like him, feel like him, act like him. Because I'm a, I'm a hot mess. Amen to that. But he's doing, that was too much amen. Um, but he was doing, he's doing all this work and he uses trials like tools in his hands. You know, I've said this before, but if you don't know, and I'm Jeff in my right ear. I was born that way. And I got hearing loss in the other, so I'm already learning sign language for when I get older because Holly and I have got to figure out how to communicate. <laughs> He's coming. But, um, but, you know, I've asked the Lord to heal me through my whole life. I've had people pray over me, anoint me with oil, lay hands on me, pray tongues over me. I've done it all. And the Lord has chosen up to this point 
to not fix my trial. But I love that I know from the scriptures, like people like a Paul who said, I had a thorn in the flesh, which was like a metaphor for something he had going on. And God directly said to him, I'm not going to fix it because I'm keeping you humble and dependent on me. And you know what? I believe with all my heart that one of the reasons that I still have the ear, you know, the deaf ear is because the Lord's like, I want to keep you humble, Ryan. No, I mean, you don't understand, like, it, especially it gets, it's getting worse, I can tell. I was in a, a banquet situation around a table, loud noise in the last couple of weeks, and I, I cannot hear people across the table. It is, it is humbling. It is frustrating. But you know what? Here's my thing. I believe with all my heart. I trust that he can do all things well. He is doing something well. He is refining me. He's keeping me humble, and that's exactly where I want to be. And don't be wrong, I'd welcome a healing right now. I, I'm, go, I'm good for that. The Lord knows that. Okay? But you know what I was thinking about as I was pondering this, this text this, this week? I teared up when I did. I probably tear up now. But I thought, you know what? If the first sound that I hear with two 100% working ears is the voice of my Lord Jesus saying to me, Ryan, welcome home, son. Well done. Then I'm, I'm good with that. Because I, I want to stay dependent on the Lord. And when I hear about the nonsense of pastor after pastor after pastor around this world doing crap and marring the name of Christ, let me be deaf in both ears if it means I stay humble and pure before his eyes. All right, do we trust him to do all things well? He is, he always is, okay? Well, let's go on real quick, two points here. A lot of times in the scriptures, uh, you know, God, God does something physical, but there's a, a spiritual lesson to it. And so these next two are kind of like that. So this guy, again, first thing, he's deaf. He can't hear. And a lot of times in the Bible, God talks about our spiritual ears, doesn't he? Those who have an ear willing to hear something, you know, he's talking about our spiritual ears. And so if we're going to do all things well, first of all, we got to be willing to listen to God's voice, spiritually speaking, don't we? Listen to God's voice so he can direct us and guide us in our life. So Salvation Church, where's the, one of the main places we can hear God's voice speak to us today? Where is it? In the Word of God in the Bible. Guys, this is such a gift from the Lord. People have died so we could have this in our hands or on our phone. Doesn't matter. It's all the Bible. And so let's get into the word of God regularly and hear his voice so he can speak to us. So he can personally meet us. So he can guide us. So he can fill us. So he can set us ablaze for him. Keep listening to his voice. Open our spiritual ears to him. This other one is this. Is also the guy's mouth, right? He couldn't talk. God did a work in his mouth. Same thing for us. We got to be willing to speak the gospel. You know, you think about it. When, when we get saved, when we, when we get born again through the gospel, our mouths, they were always working before, but the stuff coming out of our mouths wasn't always glorifying to the Lord. But now he's redeemed our mouth so we can open our mouth and do what with it? Share the gospel. God has redeemed our mouth if we're saved so we can open our mouth now to share the gospel with people. And so the challenge, guys, is this. Are we speaking the gospel? Are we speaking the gospel? God says in Romans 10, people cannot be saved from the flames of hell unless somebody opens their mouth and shares the gospel with them. Guys, this is what he says in Romans 10. You're like, well, but I thought God could use rocks and stuff. Yeah, he could do anything he wants, but that's not his plan. He has told us. He's like, listen, he literally says in Romans 10, how can they be saved unless someone tells them, which is our mouth. So brothers and sisters, I'm preaching to myself again. Stay on top of it. Lord, show me people to share the gospel with. Show me people. Who have I not shared with? Maybe I did a long time ago. I need to circle back around. Lord, you have called me to take this mouth and to glorify you by speaking the gospel. I'm so encouraged by uh, every week now in our church. And we're not some big church yet or anything, you know. But even already, 
story after story of people in this church this last week. I'll just give you a couple. One guy's on our Guatemala team, and he's like, uh, I want to practice sharing the gospel so when I go to Guatemala, I'm ready because that's all we're doing all day there, day after day. It's going to be awesome. And so he asked two coworkers if he could uh, practice the gospel with them, and he texted later saying, guys, like I shared with one, and it was just a really awesome God moment, and he's opening his heart, and all this cool stuff was going on. I mean, praise the Lord because he's faithful, willing to speak the gospel. God can use that to minister to people. Another, another guy texted me saying, hey, I had this gospel conversation with someone at work this last week, and I can just tell you story after story after story, guys, that we keep doing this. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right, we got two more points that we got to wrap this up. Here we go. Look at Mark 8. Uh, Mark 8, um, verse 1. Uh, here's what happens next. We got two points from this. In those days when, again, a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd. You hear that? Compassion. Because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry at their home, to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. So really quick, Jesus has compassion on the crowd. And you know, you think about this. If he has compassion for people who are physically just, you know, missing some meals, Think about how much compassion he must have on you and I when we're going through a really severe trial. Jesus is the most compassionate one that's ever walked the face of the planet, and he is still there willing to be compassionate to us. But here's the challenge. As he was compassionate for people, you and I, we need to have compassion on other people. Are we having compassion for others? What is compassion? Compassion is seeing someone in need and trying to meet that need. In other words, compassion leads to action. It's more than just saying, I care about you and I might pray for you, as good as that is. And it is. It is doing more. Listen to this. This is what God says himself, 1 John But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, he how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed, that's actions, and in truth. So let me ask you this, if you're married, does our spouse have a need that we need to practice compassion to actually serve them and meet them? Beyond that, all of us in life groups or DX groups, think about this, scour your group and think, is there anybody with a need and if I said, maybe I'm praying for you, that's great. But is there something beyond prayer that I can do to maybe help meet that need? I'm so encouraged to know of, of one situation in our church. I'm sure there's a lot going on. But I know one where this, uh, this, this single woman, unfortunately, got completely bamboozled by a car lot. Literally on the way home, buying the car across the Buckman Bridge from the lot to her house, the car broke down on the Buckman. And then the company said, eh, tough luck. And so she reaches out and is like, I have a need. I need some guy who knows something about cars to help me make sure I don't get a bad car again. And I put the need out to the life group guys, and I'm so thankful one guy had a compassion heart, and he had some knowledge, and that compassion led to action, and now he is walking alongside the sister in Christ to help. Compassion leads to action. So guys, just like Jesus did that, may you and I be compassionate and look for ways to serve people. And now that's what led Jesus to do what he did. Look at verse 4. His disciples answered him, how can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? Now here's what's phenomenal. If you've been walking with us through Mark, is this the first time there's a crowd of thousands of people that are hungry and they don't have any food to feed them? Is this the first time? No, it's the second time. In a very recent history here. You're, you know, remember the 5,000 and they had the... Five loaves of bread and the two fish, and Jesus supernaturally multiplied the food and fed them all. Okay? These disciples, it's like it's not even on their radar. They have completely forgotten how Jesus fixed this issue not long before. In other words, they're slow learners. Right? Now, before every one of us get proud and self-righteous, and we say, oh, how slow, self -lear slow learners they are, I wouldn't do that. We are all slow learners, are we not? Amen. And if you didn't say amen, then I would say that uh, we'll ask your parents if they thought you were a slow learner. 
Or if you're married, we'll ask your spouse. Okay, you know, like, guys, we're all still learners, all right? So, but what does Jesus do? Look at verse 5. And he asked them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground. He took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples and set before the people. And they set them before the crowd. And they had a few small fish. And having blessed them, he said to them, they said that these uh, also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied. And they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. And there were, for, there were about 4,000 people. And he sent them away. And he immediately got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanutha. So how many, how many baskets were left over? Help me out. Seven. Good job, guys. Love it. My goodness. We need you in service more often. Seven. Now, we don't know 100%. I want to make sure I make this clear. It doesn't say here's what the seven meant. Okay? But here's what a lot of theologians and so forth people think. In Hebrew numerology, the number seven means completion or perfection. It's like God's favorite number. It's actually my favorite number because of that. But anyway, um, I just want to be like Jesus. But, um, but anyway, seven is completion. Here's the, the guess, is, is that Jesus might be saying, all right, listen, the first time, how many baskets were left over? Anybody know? There was 12, okay? But this time there's seven. This is the last time I'm teaching you this lesson. Maybe that's what he's saying. You know, this lesson's complete now. Okay, this is the second time I'm doing it. You better learn the lesson. Now, what's the lesson for them and what's the lesson for you and I? Last, t- last one for us today. Are we willing to trust in God's provision in our lives? And not just in our lives. Let me make this clear. Are we, you know, I'm not saying, are we willing to trust in God's provision so that we can live life the way we want and he'll always provide what we want? That's not what it is. God never promises that, but what he promises is this, is that when you are, and I are willing to live our lives on mission for the King Jesus, he is willing, he will provide our needs of what we have when we do that. And we use, even the little bit that we have, he can supernaturally multiply it. He can provide. Do we trust him? So let me summarize it. We want to do all things well like Jesus. Well, let's be willing to get personal with God, get personal with other people. Are we willing to trust him that he's doing all things well, even if he doesn't take a trial away? He's working in our soul through the trial. Are we willing to listen to his voice? Are we willing to speak the gospel? Are we willing to have compassion on other people that leads to action? And as we do all of this, are we willing to trust in his provision? May the Lord help us with these things. All right. Well, Josiah is going to be coming up here now, and we are going to transition to Q&A. So hopefully you guys have been texting something in. If you haven't yet, there's the number again, and uh, we're going to have some fun doing this. It's on my phone? Yeah. What's on my phone? The number's on my phone. The number's on my phone. What does that mean? That's still my number. Oh, dang it. And I just let everybody spam it. Ah, okay. Well, uh, because it comes back around. <laughs> that is so funny. That's, that's what our, you get. That's my number. All right. Well, here we go. I am so sorry, man. All right. I'm not sure how that happened. But uh, so let me say this with Q and A's. Um, I just want to do my best to give you guys my thoughts and my opinions because they're awesome. No. What, what, what should come out of my mouth, guys? The Word of God. That's the only good thing worthwhile saying, okay? Now, obviously, if I, if I do, sometimes, you know, I might throw in, like, okay, here's my little thought on it, but I will clarify and say that, okay? But my biggest thing is, and every time I do this stuff, or whenever I'm on the street talking to someone, or I'm at a store talking to someone, I'm always praying under my breath, Lord, remind me of your Word, because it's His Word is the thing that will set us free. It is His Word that has life. It is His Word that is truth. And I don't know a lot, okay? In fact, the only good things I know comes from God himself. So, um, so I just want to say that. But here we go. So, um, so here we go. You, uh, yeah, I don't even know. I'm so sorry, bro. <laughs> so, Josiah, you're going to help me answer some of these things, okay? If you have thoughts and so forth about that. Sure. But I'm so sorry. I don't even know how that happened. All right, here we go. Um, the membership classes um, did a good job explaining, clarifying the role and responsibilities of the sheep and how the sheep should relate to their shepherd. But I missed the third class. Could you elaborate on how the shepherd should relate to the sheep and what the sheep should expect of you as their shepherd? 
Okay. Well, the third class uh, of the membership class is um, about an amazing gift of God and a grace of God called church discipline. And that's what it is. It is a gift and grace of God. Because if, if I were to, as a believer of Christ, start going off into sin, I call sin like mad cow disease. It makes you insane. And it makes you not think straight. And so if I start wandering off into sin, I start loving sin and justifying it or what, explaining it away or denying it, whatever it is, uh, the grace of God is, is a process that he's given us in Matthew 18, for instance, to, to awaken such an a, a, a unrepentant, sinning brother or sister in Christ to bring us to repentance and bring us back to the Lord. So that's what the third session is actually about. Um, but when you're asking here, the, how, elaborate more on how the shepherd should relate to the sheep. And what the sheep should expect of you as their shepherd. So um, I would say read First uh, Peter chapter uh, 3, um, right, 5. Which one? Help me out. Which one's the, I get these mixed up. The marriage one is First Peter. All right, I'm looking it up. No one's helping me. Come on, man. All right, here we go. First Peter 3. Yep, that's the marriage one. First Peter 5. Okay, so um, 1 Peter 5, uh, the first seven verses, I think it is, of that text. And it's talking about the relationship between pastors and the, the, the members of a church. And so, um, but like for instance in there, it says, I should shepherd the flock among you well. Um, it, it says that I should care, you know, as a pastor. And this is, just, this is not just like lead pastors, like paid pastors. This is when you have a pastor team. Now, in our church, we're, we don't have one on the ground here yet because we're a church plant. But there's going to be a day coming when we'll actually have a team of pastors. Some will be vocational like me and some will be non-vocational. Um, but whoever these people are, that they should care for, like you imagine, and I love the metaphor God brings up, which is shepherds and sheep. You know, a shepherd takes care of, feeds, protects from danger, um, and so forth. And so in the same way, it's that, it's that loving relationship um, that we should have for each other. Part of the feeding, what is the way that I, a pastor feeds people? Spiritually speaking, it's the word of God, right? And so literally, like even like a Q&A time like this, the best thing I can do is give you First Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 7, for instance, um, and, and so forth. Hebrews 13, 17 says to members of a church, um, it says, obey your leaders, which would be at least the pastors of your church. Obey your leaders, submit to their authority, for they keep watch over you as one who must give an account. So, so who are we going to give an account for as, parent, as par uh, pastors? We're going to give an account to God, how we pastored the people under our care. Um, but it says to the members that they should obey them, submit to their authority, um, and, um, you know, and, and then it goes on, it says, and um, obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for what advantage would that be to you? And so, in other words, like as parents, um, you know, kids, guess what, kids? When you obey your parents, you make their job more enjoyable, you know? And when you don't, it makes it hard and not fun, you know? And in the same way, that's what God is talking about in Hebrews 13, 17 with pastors and people in the church is like, if people in a church are like, you know, giving their pastors a hard time about things that they just, it's just irrelevant, like you're just making their job hard, you know what I mean? And so you just kind of, you, you think about that, and the other way on it, though, is this. Every pastor, every pastor needs to have that judgment day burned into their mind every day. And I tell you what, it helps me. The more I think about that day, it helps me to keep myself aligned to the Lord. Because I, I picture myself standing before God and him saying, all right, Ryan, let's look at how you did as a pastor. Now, hell is not an issue for any of us that are born again. Romans 8, 1, there's now no, no more condemnation for those found in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. But there still is a, get this, this is not said in a lot of churches. I know pastors that do not believe this and will not teach this. And I fundamentally, biblically disagree with them. There is still a judgment day for us as Christians. It's called the Bema Seat of Christ. Okay, you can read it for yourself in this text. 
in the Bible, there's two judgment days. There's the great white judgment. If you're in that line, guys, I don't want you in that line. Please don't go to that line. You're like, how do I get in that line? Give your life to Christ, and that's how you get out of that line, okay? The one line is for people who rejected the gospel, never gave their life to Christ, and it is, the, it is judgment to hell. That's that line. But there's another judgment called the Bema Seat of Christ, where as Christians, we also will give an account for all of us for our lives. And then pastors, ours is even higher accountability on that day of how we did in serving and leading God's people. And so I have that day, I have that moment in my mind because I'm like, I, I want to honor the Lord. I don't want to displease him. I hope I've done a good job. Like I was saying earlier, I hope he says to me, Ryan, you know, good try. No, I'm just kidding. But like, hey, you, uh, you did a great job, man. I'm proud of you. You know, I want, I want that for his glory. So anything you would add to any of that? Not to that note, but I did have a question for you. Oh, good. Uh, so in Galatians 5, we've been going over the fruit of the Spirit uh, in our young adults group. And um, every time I ask the same questions, and we start off with the same questions, just kind of try to reinforce ideas. So the first one I always ask is, what does it look like to walk by the Spirit? So I was curious what your answer would be for that. Yeah, Jesus. Okay, next one. <laughs> <laughs> really, though, I mean, you think about it, guys. God came here in the flesh and then inspired four people to write down his life and his words and his actions. He is our perfect example. I mean, think about that. If he didn't come here, like I think I was thinking about this not long ago, like the Old Testament believers, they didn't have God in the flesh to look up to to figure out how to honor God, Yahweh, right? But we have Jesus, who is God in the flesh, and his life and his words. I would say study in, you know, Jesus' life, those gospels, those four gospels, like we're doing here in Mark, you know, like, and just model everything he did. You know you can't go wrong, right? And because we know he was filled by the Spirit. He was perfectly filled by the Spirit. He had all the fruits of the Spirit. Look to him. Because honestly, we, once we start looking at people, <laughs> they're going to let us down, Right? And don't be wrong, I, I like to look at like a Billy Graham and say, man, praise God, he didn't fall into some of the nonsense scandal stuff that we keep seeing happen. Praise God for someone's life like that, right? But he still wasn't perfect, right? Jesus is our model. Um, that's what it looks like. Does that make sense? Now, of course, then when you analyze your life and you say, okay, you go through that list of fruit, you know, you, just, like, you say like David did, holy, you know, God, show me my heart. He, he Search my heart, oh God. Show me in faithfulness. Am I being faithful, Holy Spirit? Because you know one of the most scary things in life is that we can deceive ourselves. You know that? Like, like we can deceive ourselves. So, so that's why asking the Holy Spirit, because I'll tell you, he's, he's convicted me at times when I didn't have the conviction right away. And I said, Holy Spirit, search my heart and so forth. And he showed me some things. I'm like, oh, that's right. Another way is to get other people around us that love us like in our life groups or DX groups or so forth, and just our spouses, you know. Hey, tell me, um, what, do you see the fruit of the Spirit in me? So, so does that answer that a little bit? I went with Jesus. Kind of answers pretty good, but okay. Good. All right, here's another scene we got um, going through here. Okay, the Millennium. Uh, Falcon is a great ship. Just for you, Daryl. Um, <laughs> can you explain the Millennium? Uh, who will be a part of it? Uh, will there be people who aren't saved living during that time? Will there be sin? Uh, where will those of us saved be during the millennium? And what is its overall purpose? That's awesome. So we got like an hour now to answer that. That's great. Okay, that's really good. So yeah, we have about five minutes. <laughs> I know, right? Seriously. Okay. Um, so let me say this about the end times. I encourage you to go to our website to our beliefs page, okay? And you can read what, what is our non-negotiable beliefs about the end times, okay, on there. And it's not an exhaustive list of things on there, okay? Um, Jesus is coming back, praise the Lord, and he is going to um, rule and make all things under his foot, under his feet, right? He's going to rule the world. He's going to end sin. He's going to throw Satan into hell. And then every unbeliever, sadly, but, you know, the, the right judgment of, of God. And so that's all happening. Now, every, all the events leading between now and the ultimate end state of heaven on earth, um, that is where um, I definitely have opinions about. 
but I don't, I do, I will not die on a number of hills of the certain potential beliefs of these kinds of things, like maybe some other people would do. Um, so, so this is one of those things where I can give you scripture for every one of these, but again, I know I can give you scripture for other viewpoints too. Okay, so everybody's in the scriptures. We're just interpreting the scriptures of maybe a little different, and no one is necessarily. Uh, destroying scripture in their different interpretations. I know some people would disagree with me on that, but that's why I'm saying this is not a hill. I, I think that you can have a high view of scripture and come out on, on a couple different views of these things. So here's my personal, if, if for whatever that's worth. I believe, that, I do believe the millennium um, is a literal six, uh, uh, 1,000 years that is still coming in the future. I do not believe we're in it right now, kind of things like that. Um, so I'm, um, I'm pre-millennial in that way. I believe it is still coming. I believe that Jesus is going to return to the literal city of Jerusalem in Israel. We should support Israel. God is not done with the people, the nation, the ethnic group of the Jews. Um, that, that Romans uh, 9 teaches about that. That there is going to be a day where he will remove the spiritual. Ah, we're going to tie into the, no, it won't. It won't tie into the sermon because that was deafness. But he's going to, how about that? He's going to remove the scales off their eyes. He's going to remove the plugs from their spiritual ears. And the, and the mass majority of the Jewish people will look upon him whom they pierced. And they will see that Jesus, Yeshua, always was the Messiah. And they will repent and be born again and be saved. Okay? And so all this to say, there's a lot of things central to Israel. Let me say this. I was a history major before God called me in college to be a pastor. And I'm telling you, there is no historical explanation for, for so much activity in that land of Israel and over the Jewish people. I mean, just recently, I mean, the anti-Semitism that even has crept into the church, God help brothers and sisters in Christ that have that view, that is from the pit of hell. But the, the hatred towards the Jewish people cannot historically be explained, cannot humanly be explained. It makes no sense historically why one people group multiple times through the ages have other people tried to wipe them out time and time again. And I'll tell you what, there is no human explanation how that same people group still exists today with so many people. No group in the history of the world has had so many people after them trying to wipe them out as the Jewish people. That is not coincidence. I believe with all my heart, according to scriptures, God has a special place in his heart. I mean, in, in Mark, just a few weeks ago, remember the table? God had a special place to the Jewish people in heart. He was ministering to them first. There's no question about it. He's not done with them. Now, we are in a, um, the age of the Gentiles, according to Romans 9, where God is unleashing his spear and the gospel is growing. The church is growing among all the nation people groups. There are still Jewish people coming to know Christ. We should still keep, keep trying to share the gospel with them. But we know, again, according to Romans 9, there will be an, uh, an awakening, a revival, and a bunch of them will come to know Christ. And, and so um, God's going to do all that in the end times. But when Jesus comes back, he will have that thousand years in Jerusalem. Now, here's my, this is complete opinion. It does not say this in, in Scripture clearly. Because I love that last question. What's the purpose of all of that? What, what, why doesn't he just, for instance, why doesn't he just come, end it all, bring the kingdom of God with it? What's this whole thousand year thing? Here's, here's my thought on it. I think that Jesus, okay, he's the perfect righteous judge, and there's payments that have to be paid for all things, okay? And praise God, if you put your faith in Christ, the payment's been paid by him. You don't have to pay it, praise the Lord. But if you don't, you are going to pay for it in hell. Repent, give your life to Christ. But, um, but also this world, we have rebelled against God ruling over us in this world. And I think that the millennium seems to make sense to me that Jesus is going to come back and bring his power, his reign, his rule over this world as it is. Even while there's still sin in the world and he's going to rule over because he deserves to before he wipes out everything at the end. Like it's a part of his process of renewing and fixing um, and, and, and reversing everything, you know. Um, and so he does that for a thousand years, and then he finally says, okay, that's it. I'm going to strip sin out of the world completely again, et cetera, et cetera. But that's a guess. We really don't know from Scripture what the purpose of uh, the, the millennial reign. But I would like to think it fits into him redo renewing everything at the end. So I think I might have answered most of those. But 
Uh, let's see here. Are, are there going to be people not saved? I believe so. I, I believe that the people can still be saved during those days and so forth. But again, not a hill that I'm willing to die on. We're going to do one more just because this is fun. Okay. Um, so, and I'm just going through order of these guys. So uh, sorry if I don't get it to it. Next time you'll be texting me like a week before because you're like, I want to be high on the list. Okay. Um, when making life choices that the Bible does not have a direct reference for, what steps are involved to make a good decision that honors God? Exa- example, major pur- purchase like a house or a car. Great question. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of things in life, right? God doesn't say, I want you to buy this, you know, certain car today, you know? So, the, the, but the scriptures are full of the principles of God, the wisdom of God. So Proverbs, read Proverbs, you know, there's 31 of them. You could actually read one every day, every month, you know, and just, but just like the, the wisdom that comes from those. Um, but the ideas of um, pray extremely hard about debt, for instance, um, it says in the scriptures, debt is like being a slave, you know, to that debt. Um, and, and so I'm not, again, I'm not someone who would say you never get debt. I'm, I don't believe it's necessarily saying that. It's just saying be aware of the seriousness of debt. And, and so that's going to be a principle you're going to play into buying something. Why in the world would you go into that if you don't, if you don't think you have a, a good reason to be able to pay the bills? Um, getting godly wisdom. A proverb says a wise person has many advisors. It is a foolish person in life who only makes their decisions by themselves all the time. And it doesn't really matter how old we are. I mean, all of us, we can, val- we can get value from running ideas by godly, biblically-minded people in our lives to bounce thoughts of, off of. Um, that's a humble person, and that's a wise person who asks other people their advice, too, before going into decisions. So um, those, are a cu- those are a couple quick principles, but just taking the scriptures like that, um, those are the big ones. You know, obviously, yeah, well, I guess the question said if there's nothing in the Bible that says it's, it's, it's wrong. Obviously, if the Bible says it's wrong, don't do it. But so any other thoughts you throw in there before we end? Not that I would know. No? Okay. Well, this was a fun first round. <laughs> Next time we'll get it going to whoever's doing the facilitating. But uh, appreciate you up here. You have a good smile anyway, brother. So, all right. Well, hey, let's pray. Jesus, we just thank you for this time that we're able to look at some of these kinds of subjects and um, – be able to, to hear your words, ultimately, that's what we want to hear, God. And so I hope that, that, um, that we were all served uh, in this time um, as we mentioned different scriptures about these subjects. Um, thank you, God, that you took the time in history to speak from your heavens into our fallen and messed up world full of foolishness, full of sin, full of evil. And that you gave us truth, that Jesus, you said, if we're willing to hear it, it will set us free. And that's just not just salvation free. That is free from foolishness, for instance. That is free from all sorts of things in this life. So, Lord, would you help us, as we said in the text today, just help us to listen to your voice more and more, getting into the word of God. Thank you for the gift it is. Lord, I pray as we go the rest of this weekend. I know a lot of us are going to be hanging out with people today and tomorrow. I pray that we would live on mission for you, Jesus, willing to speak the gospel. Fill us with your spirit as we, until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen.